Here we are, one human family. Here we come, one human family. Here we come, one human family. Here we are, one human family. Here we are, one human family. Here we come, 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 one human family. Here we are, one human family. Here we come, one human family. Here we come, one human family. Here we are, one human family. I could listen to that song all day today. I got to tell you, wow, holy smokes. That was what, what I just experienced was called a technological breakdown. For some reason, everything decided not to work today. It wouldn't go through. And what can I do? Got to keep my cool because I'm here for you. I am here for you. I just got my shoes on. Now I get to put the lights in place. Today is a very special day. I hope you're doing great. You know what today is? It's Fantastic Friday. It's Fantastic Friday. It's Fantastic Friday. It's Fantastic Friday. I love Fantastic Friday. I love setting the lights up with you. Pa pa pow. Can you even believe it? Pa pa pow. It's a little overcast outside here today in beautiful downtown Sherman Oaks, Los Angeles, California. And that's okay. It's a perfect day. <sighs> my, my family, my friends, my fun friend, you, let me share something with you. We are gonna start this day with something really important. A breath of air. Remember how to do that? So get ready, we're gonna take a breath of air. Here it comes, here it comes. We're gonna breathe in through our nose and we're gonna exhale through our mouth and we're gonna do it three times. Are you ready? Here we go. Inhale. Hold it. Exhale. Inhale. Hold it. Exhale. One more time. Inhale. Hold it. Exhale. That brings the air. See, air comes into our system. It goes right to our brain and brings oxygen to our thinking. And then suddenly we're brighter and faster and better than before. And it's that simple. It even changes how we feel. It can change our mood. Breathing is very important. So, you know, on Wednesday, I talked about some things and I didn't talk about some things. And so it, I don't know that I was clear. And so I wanted to take this opportunity since you and I have this time to share today to be a little clearer. And I've thought a lot about what I want to say to you and still I'm not exactly sure, but my heart's in the right place. And that's the very first step we get to take whenever we want to go anywhere. It doesn't matter if we want to go to the store. It doesn't matter if we want to go to school. It doesn't matter if we want to go to the moon. Our heart gets to be in the right place. And so how I, how I find my heart in the right place is I think about what is inspiring my action. Why am I taking this action? Like when I go to school, the reason I changed my heart to go to school is because I know when I'm going to school, I'm working to better myself and I'm also working for my future self. When you are going to school, what you're doing is you're working for your future self. And it's actually pretty easy to find your future self. Your future self is there looking at you right now. You don't know it yet, 
but I can show you how. How you can find your future self looking at you right now. So you know how you, let's say you're 10, let's say you're eight. Can you imagine back when you were five? Can you imagine when you were five? Can you, can you really imagine when you were five? Can you really do it? You were different, weren't you? So if you can imagine back on your five, can you think of something that happened when you were five that you remember really clearly? Like I remember my five-year-old birthday really well. And so I can find that memory in my head. I can think back and I can find a memory. Can you find a memory of when you were five years old? Can you, can you? Can you find that memory? Do you have it? Do you have the memory of when you were five years old? Do you have it in your head right now? When you were five. For grownups, it takes a little more work because we've got so many years past when we were five. When you're 10 or nine or eight or seven, you can remember really quick when you were five. So find that memory and, hold, and look at it, find it. Now, see that person in there, that person that was you? You can engage, which means talk, with that person, with that memory. Not like a YouTube video, not like talking to a YouTube video. It's like being in a video game. And you know how we are characters in video games? That's our player. So that person who we were is like the, per is like the character, or maybe we're the character, but we get to engage with them. And so if we wanna send them a message, like you're doing a great job, that's a good message. If you wanna send them that message, oh, I found a string. I found a string. Got it. Like when I was five and I was having my birthday, the message I send to me is, you're gonna remember this forever. You're gonna remember this birthday forever. And I've been sending him that message for a long time. And you know what? I do remember that memory. I told him to remember it and he did. And now that memory is with me now. So if you have some memory, oh, there's another time when I was seven, I went for, I got in, I got in a race of, of where I was in a foot race and there was a lot of people there and my mom had to go somewhere. So she dropped me off with the coach and I was, I was seven. And then after the race was over, I was really hungry, really hungry. And I didn't know what to do. My mom hadn't got back there yet. I was okay. I was just really hungry. And so what I did as a grown up is I went and I told my seven year old self, go find a hamburger. There's hamburgers over there. So I didn't know how to get a hamburger because I didn't have any money with me. And I, did, I don't know if, if at seven I knew how to use money, but I went up to the person who was selling the hamburgers and I said, I'm really hungry. And they said, where's your mom or dad? And they said, I said, they're not here yet. And that person just smiled and gave me that hamburger. Now I'm a vegetarian now, so I don't eat meat. But at that time, I want you to know that that hamburger meant the world to me. And I, I, and so I go back in my memory and I encourage that seven year old who was really sad about not having anybody around to help him get food, that he has the power to get that hamburger. Go ask. The worst that a person can do is say no. And if they had said no, maybe I would tell him, go ask somebody else. But I talk with that memory and I encourage him and I walk him through it. So he was having a bad time, but because me as a grown up look back at him and support him when he made a powerful decision, it turned a bad time into a good time and a good memory. And I've done that with all my memories. And so that's how you can do it with your past self. Like if you're nine or 10 or 11 or seven, you can talk with your five-year-old self. Now, like I said, I was gonna show you how to find your future self. In the same way that you can look and see your memory, when you're, if you're 10, you can find your five-year-old self, or if you're nine, you can find your five-year-old self, or if you're seven, you can find your five-year-old self. Your 20-year-old self is looking at you right now. Your 20 year old self is looking at you right now, watching this show and remembering it. 
And now you can, now that you know that, you can look forward and find that 20 year old self looking at you and see what they want from you, see what they want you to bring them. Because when we study and we practice certain things, like if we practice sports or if we study math, we bring skills. Maybe your 20 year old self is in college and needs you to study science a lot. And that's what you can do. You can look forward in the same way you can look back. Because in the same way that you look back and see yourself when you were younger, your future self is looking back at you right now. That's powerful, right? It's a special power. I don't share it with everybody, but I'm sharing it with you. You can practice it. So speaking of speak, like special powers and special abilities and the way we think of ourselves is very important. That's like it, it, imag- it, it, allow, it gives us permission to imagine ourselves as capable, as powerful, as unstoppable. I love these feelings. I love, I love these thoughts. I love these powers. A, a friend of mine said to me yesterday, there's a lot of stuff going on right now in the world. And I think I figured it all out. I was like, oh yeah? I said, what's going on? His name is Gene Bonaire. He's one of my best friends. He said, Black Lives Matter is going on. Black Lives Matter. I'm sure you've heard that. A lot of people are talking about it right now. Black Lives Matter. And it's true. Black lives do matter. And he knows and I know that when we say Black Lives Matter, it means that Black Lives Matter as much as all lives. Black Lives Matter as much as white lives or yellow lives or brown lives or red lives. And so when a situation is in place, when something's happening where it doesn't seem like the lives that are black are as, as valuable or as important as the lives of, of, that are white or the lives that are yellow or the lives that are brown or the lives that are red, then we get to remind people that black lives matter too. Also, as much as. And so that's why Black Lives Matter is, is really important right now because it seems like sometimes black lives are undervalued, which doesn't make any sense. And so if there's a situation like when I was hungry and I didn't say anything about it, I might get into trouble. What if I was hungry and I didn't say anything? I could get sick. I could even die. It's true. Have you ever been so thirsty that you passed out? I've done that before. I became what's called dehydrated. A dehydrated, I got dehydrated. And I just, it's like falling asleep fast. And everybody saw it, so they got me hydrated. It happens, it happens to kids. Or overheated, you ever get overheated? That happens to kids too. It's because our bodies are brand new when we're kids. And so we're still developing uh, stamina and, and, the processes that enable us to communicate that we need water or hydration. And so when we're really thirsty, it's upon us to communicate. Here's the funny thing. Um, my son's sister is named Iana and she, she has, she's, she has, she's six years old. She's six years old. And so she has feelings and she has thoughts, but she hasn't learned how to communicate them yet. So that, cross, that creates frustration. And what happens with her is she, she throws a tantrum. She throws tantrums. And I used to throw tantrums. I told you before, that was my middle, that was my superhero name, Tantrum. And also another superhero name I had was Pout. I don't wanna. That was, that was one of my superhero names. So Yana had a, Yana is, is dealing with, she's six and she's, she's six. And she deals with tantrum because she hasn't learned how to communicate her feelings. But because you're older and smarter and have had more experience with life and because I'm a grown up and I know how to do it, I know that if I have feelings or if I have needs, that it's upon me to communicate that to people. Because I anticipate, I expect that people will listen to me and hear me when I say these things. So, like in a similar way, if Iana has needs and she communicates them, she puts them to words, she uses her words, then it's the most amazing thing's gonna happen. Chances are, it's gonna, she's gonna get what she needs. Not just what she wants, but what she needs. 
And that changes everything. And we all go through that. When we're little, little kids, we don't know how to use our words and we don't know how to communicate and we get frustrated and we, and we, sometimes we throw tantrums, but sometimes we just cry. Sometimes we're, we're, we're not, uh, when we're babies, when we're very, very babies and we don't even know words, we cry because we don't know how to communicate. And then when we're older, when we get like two years old and we start to use words like food, like drink, then suddenly we're communicating with the people around us and it makes it easier for everybody. And as we get older, we get six and we're like, okay, so I need to talk with somebody. Like I need to talk with my dad or I need to talk with my mom or I need to call somebody or I need to see somebody or I need food or I'm really hungry. We get to communicate these things and it changes everything. Well, similarly with Black Lives Matter, there's people around the world who feel like that they need something. Not that they want something, that they need it. And, it's not, and they're not getting it. And like one thing that people could want, that people could want, that all of us want, is to have, is to have respect. We all want respect. And if we don't get respect, sometimes we become disrespectful. And, uh, or, we hit, or we get angry, or we throw a tantrum. And I got to tell you, sometimes that's fair and sometimes that's legitimate. I don't know that it always works the way we want it to. It seems like it should. I tell you what, if me getting angry would get me what I wanted, I would get angry all the time. But I'm 55 and I learned the hard way that being angry doesn't always get me what I want. In fact, at 55, getting angry, being angry almost never gets me what I want. So I learned other ways to communicate. I write it down, I speak, I speak it. Sometimes people are frustrated when I'm explaining that I'm not getting what I need and that's okay. I help them work through it. And then sometimes they apologize. It's like, wow, I didn't understand. That happens. And then I think that I've been in situations before where the best thing that I could do was nothing. Remember the song, remember what I said? If you don't know what to do, do something. And if you don't know what to do, do nothing. But do it with intention. If you don't know what to do, do something. Like if you don't think you're being heard, a good way to, to, to let people know that you're not being heard is to, is to uh, protest. Is to say, hey, I'm not being heard. And another way to do it, that would be doing something. Another way to do it would be to do nothing. And I, li I like this way a lot. Look at this. Here's how I do nothing. This is a great, this is terrific. I'm very proud of this. I didn't invent it. I just learned it. I will just sit down. And I won't, I won't move. I won't go anywhere. I won't be mad, I won't be angry, no matter how mad or how angry people get around me. I just sit down, just like this. And I've sat like this before, and not, I'm like, I'm not moving. Nope, you're not hearing me. I'm not hearing, I'm not, I'm not fighting. I'm not fighting, and I'm not getting angry. But I might cry. And I might sing. You know what song I sing? I got a song that I sing. I got a song that I sing. I really, 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 really do. When I can't, when I'm not getting heard and I need people to hear me and I'm not going to get angry because I've, because I'm 55 and I've already done anger and it didn't get me what I wanted. So I learned other ways. And so one of the things I do is I sing. And here's the song I sing, and I'm sharing it with you. <sighs> this land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land is made for you and me. 
This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land is made for you and me. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land is made for you and me. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land is made for you and me. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land is made for you and me. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land is made for you and me. And I can sing that song for a long time. I love that song. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land is made for you and me. And people love that song. It's hard not to be happy when you sing that song. And it really communicates what this is all about. What all of this is all about. That we share in this together. So when I do that, when I sit down and I just decide I'm not moving until I get hurt and I'm not getting angry, amazing things happen. I am not movable. I will not get angry. I don't care if people yell at me. Nope. I will cry. I will cry. Because I want people to know that how I feel. But sitting down to me is one of the most powerful ways to get, making change happen. If you're unhappy, sit down until you're heard. If you want something to change, we can sit down until we're heard. It is, it is, it is, here's the funny thing. I didn't invent it. People have been doing this for a long time. And it, here's, the, here's the other funny thing. It always works. It works every single time. Because if we're angry and we're fighting, sometimes people can't hear us. They think we're just being mean. But when we sit down and, and we listen and we share until we're heard and we sing and we cry and we sing again, eventually, I guarantee, people will hear us. So I always say take a seat. Just take a seat. You want to get hurt? Take a seat. Take a seat is a great motto. Take a seat. Black Lives Matter? Take a seat. 100%. Want to get hurt? Take a seat. Nobody can move me. They can pick me up. I might have friends with me and I have my arms locked and they're like, they have to pick us all up. I'm not going to fight though. I'm 55. What I mean when I say I'm 55 is you learn stuff along the way. And sometimes you learn the hard way. It's not like I came this way. I used to fight. I used to argue. I used to get angry. I can still get angry. I get frustrated. And then I take a step back. I usually take a few breaths. And it, and it changes everything. It really does. So I know a lot of people are talking about all of this right now. And I want you to know, I want you to know like this, this, uh, black lives matter is about all of us. It is it because lives matter. And if one kind of life or one life that we think is a kind, cause we're all really just one kind. We're the human kind. If one kind doesn't feel like it's being heard, 
then a great way to get hurt is just to sit down. Heard, not hurt. One, one kind might feel like they're being hurt. And so if that's the case, then it's time to be heard. And the way that I get heard is to take a seat. And, you know, that was what my friend was telling me, Gene Barnier. Remember I said that Gene Barnier was telling me something, but he told me something even, even like that's why we started to talk about it. Because Black Lives Matter, that's why, that's what made this amazing conversation take place. And then he said the most brilliant thing. This made me so happy. It was such a great thing that Gene Barnier said. My friend, he came from Haiti. I've known him for almost my whole life. He said, we are smart enough to change America. We are smart enough to change America. We are smart enough to change America. That means me and you, all of us, we're smart enough. We're smart enough. And look how awesome that is. I got, it's great news. Hey, guess what? We are smart enough to change America. We get to change, we get to do it. We can change, if there's a problem, if there's a challenge, we can change everything. We, can, we get to change. It's amazing. And I really do know what this problem and challenge is all about. I do. It is the illusion of scarcity. Scarcity is when you think you don't have enough. Here, let me show you. This is chocolate. I love chocolate. I really do. And there's not a whole candy bar in here. There's not a whole chocolate bar. There's only a part of a chocolate bar. Whoops, one of the lights went out. Here, let me, let me change that real quick. We got time. This is a chocolate bar. I love chocolate. And there's not a whole chocolate bar here. See, part of it's gone. And I know where it went, by the way. So, do I have enough? Do I have enough to share? Like each one, there's two pieces. One, two, three, four. Let's flip it over. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, there's 11 pieces of chocolate. So what happens if there's 12 people? What happens if there's 14 people? What happens if there's 20 people? So then maybe I don't wanna share because there won't be enough for everybody. But that's not the right way to look at it really. The right way to look at it is, let's get some more chocolate. Because there's definitely more chocolate. There's enough for everybody. And that's why the illusion of scarcity is an illusion. Because there really is enough for everybody. There's enough food. There's enough water. There's enough air. There's enough house. There's enough house. There's enough medical supplies. There really is enough for everybody. We have enough. That's where we get to change our mindset. We get to let go of the illusion, which is a mistaken belief. The illusion of scarcity and embrace abundance, that there is enough. And how I learned this, by the way, is because of space. You know, we're on a spaceship here on planet Earth. We're a spaceship, it's, a, it's that simple. Once you go to space, you see it. Once a person goes to space, you see very clearly that the whole Earth is a spaceship. You see it because we're surrounded by space. We're moving in space. We're constantly moving in space. We're constantly moving surrounded by space in space. And you can see all this, you can kind of see the stuff around us. If you're in space, it's hard to see the stuff around us because the light is so bright when it reflects from the planet Earth. So, one of the things about when you're out in space is you see how big and vast the whole solar system and universe is. There's so much. It would never, ever, 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 ever run out. And, the, and all we got to do is get up off the planet to, to see that. So the planet is not so small and there's not so many people that there isn't enough on the spaceship for us. We just get to organize a little better. I think one of the ways that we can organize is to go to space. Like when we send people to space, 
there's something called the overview effect. I should write that down. I want you to know this. I mean, it is space class, you know. I know we're talking about Black Lives Matter, and I know we're talking about how smart you are, and I know we're talking about taking a seat to make a change. Uh, but there, there's a, there, this isn't just out of nowhere. We got, these came from places. So there's a man named Frank White, a person, and he came up with this thing. He noticed that astronauts who go to space see something that other people haven't seen. It's called the overview effect. And so from space, you can see, we get to see that the world is different than how we see it on the ground. On the ground, we see fences and we see borders and we see state lines and we see national lines and we see separation of one place and another. But in space, we see that it's not really separated, that that's, we just create those. So in space, we're able to organize the resources better. So what if we use the overview effect for leaders to go to space? Not, not, ju not just people who are wealthy, but everybody. For people to go to space and see, oh, wow, there's not really any fences. There's not really any borders. It's all one big spaceship. That's a great use of the overview effect. And then people could see that there's, we're, not, we're, not, we're, we're not really, there isn't scarcity. We have enough. There's enough space. There's enough people. There's enough food. There's enough water. There's enough of everything for everybody. When we have the illusion of scarcity, that's when we get to a place where we think that some people are less important than others. And that is, that is where we get to change. We are smart enough to change America. And not just change America, change our minds, change the world, change the way we look at everything. And how we can do that is by going to space. Getting the overview effect and see how it's all just one big spaceship. So we are smart enough to change America. Maybe it's the way we change it, we look at everything. Actually, I believe it's the way we, look, we change the way we look at everything. So if you have a few people with a lot and you have a lot of people with too little, then we get to distribute it differently. I don't know how yet, but I know this, we're smart enough to figure it out. My friend John, John Bonaire came up with that idea. We are smart enough to change America. Oh, but here's the thing that matters. I knew that what he said was true when he proposed it, when he suggested it, because I know you, I know you. You are smart enough to figure it out for all of us. You. And I know that because the person who invented television was 14. They were a kid. Kids invent the best things because you don't have to worry about all this stuff. Like, like a lot of grumps are working through Black Lives Matter. And you can see everybody really upset and, and angry and protesting or happy or crying or sad or, or busy. So busy. And so you, because you're not so busy, get to think about a different way of doing everything. How to change, because you're smart enough. And you can figure out how to change America to make it work for all of us. For everybody. So everybody has the enough that's already here. We have enough. You get to figure out how to move it around. How to distribute it, make it, make it so that everybody has enough. How it gets distributed. That's a better way to put it. We're smart enough to do this. It's not that big a deal. It's not. It's so not big a deal which I think is really cool, that it's not that big a deal. We seem like it's a big a deal. Grumps take things seriously. Have you ever seen grumps at a football game? Grumps can take things way too serious, or at any sporting event, really. I've seen grumps take golf too serious. So, now, this is a saying that I learned when I was you, a long time ago, and it's very important, and it applies to this moment and what we're talking about right here. A bud, like a flower bud, a bud becomes a rose when the pain of remaining the same, I mean, it's not changing, but when the pain of remaining the same becomes greater than the fear of change. Like some people don't wanna, don't wanna some people stay the same because they're afraid of changing. Some, some companies stay the same, some businesses, some, some, uh, some like uh, once upon a time, uh, remember, do you know what a phone book is? We used to have a book of phone numbers and we don't need that anymore because we have the internet and it's got everybody's phone number on it. So the people who had the phone book, had the business of the phone book, they didn't want to change. They've been doing the phone book for 40 years. But, they, but then the pain of remaining the same for the phone book meant the phone book was going to go out of business. So they had to change so that they're online and not making an actual book. 
And that was helpful because then they stopped using, they don't, we used to use so much paper and so many trees to produce a phone book, which we changed every year. So all of these extra phone books, and now we don't do that anymore. We just post it on the internet and everybody can go to it with our devices. So easy. So a bud becomes, and so then the yellow pages move from becoming a bud into a rose because they made a change. Now people do this all the time. A bud becomes a rose when the pain of remaining the same becomes greater than the fear of change. You as a bud, you can be a kid and be a bud and you can be a grown up and be a rose and the pain of remaining the same, like we get to shift. You ever do something that's very grown up and people's like, wow, that was really mature. That was really grown up. That's when you start to become the rose. Because, and, and even though you didn't want to become the rose, maybe, maybe, you, maybe here's, a, here's a good one. My son, Raphael, is nine and he forgets to, he used to, he used to forget to buckle his seatbelt. Well, that's an important thing. And for him, you know, grownups get to think about stuff all the time, paying bills, getting dinner, making sure everybody's safe, making sure that there's clothes, all kinds of stuff we think about all the time. So we shouldn't have to think about, we shouldn't have to think about reminding a nine-year-old to buckle their seatbelt because he's been doing it for at least, at least five years. So I got to wake him up. I call it a wake up, a wake up conversation. And then I got to remind him how hard his mom works, how hard she works all the time to make sure that he has all the stuff that he needs. And he's got a little bit of responsibility. And one of them is buckling his seatbelt. Like you, when you get in the car, you, you get to buckle your seatbelt. Having a car means you get to buckle your seatbelt. That's an advantage. So when we don't have to think about it as grownups, you make life better for everyone. And that means you grew. And while it was easy not to have to think about buckling your seatbelt, and that was, that was when uh, you were a bud. You become a rose when not buckling your seatbelt. Like, Raphael had a serious conversation with me about it. So he got a little bit of pain about that. He didn't want to have that serious conversation. He'd rather save our conversations for reading books and stuff. And so then the fear of change, meaning that he would have to take, he would get to take responsibility. He gets to take responsibility. That's a change. Maybe he didn't want to. Maybe he wanted to stay a kid. When I was him, I wanted to stay a kid. I was like, I looked at grownups and I'm like, I don't want to be a grownup. I'm going to, I'm going to be a kid. But you know what? As we get older, we see that there's things we want to do. And the only way to get them is to be more responsible. Like Raphael maybe want to go on a bike ride by himself, but if he can't buckle a seatbelt, we can't trust him to be on his bike by himself. But when we see that he is, he always remembers to buckle a seatbelt, or he always mem remembers to close the door on the way out, or he always remembers to pick up his clothes and put them in the, in the basket for, in the laundry room, or he always remembers to do his homework without having to be reminded, then we know that he's starting to mature. He's becoming the rose. So this doesn't just work with kids. This works with grown-ups too. This works with society. That's all of us working together. That's what we call society. This works with civilization. That's everything. That when we, like we, we do things for a certain amount of time and it seems like it's working, but then we, don't, we realize, oh, that's not actually working. Like if a few people have too much and a lot of people don't have enough, that's not working. Maybe it worked for a time and now it's a new time. And so we get to shift, but it doesn't feel comfortable to shift. That's the fear of change. We're like, wow, especially the people who are, over, who are overly wealthy, they got a lot. Like some people are overly wealthy, they have too much. Not just regular wealthy, but overly wealthy, so much. And they just don't know how to, how to distribute it. They don't know what to do with it. And then there's the people who don't have enough. And they don't know how to get, an, get enough, get something, a little more. So there's a, there's a pain right there. How do I, and also like the people who don't have enough, think about this. Like we, we go on with our life and we're like, okay, well, this is what worked. This is what worked. This is what worked. This is what worked, but it's not working anymore. And we're, we don't want to change though, because what if it's not as, what if it's not as good as it already is? 
Woo, the head games. These are head games. These are thoughts that we think that we, we tease ourselves with. We do this. As grown-ups, we do this. As kids, we do this. We do it like a, on a, when you're playing a sport. You're like, what if I play soccer and I'm not good and people laugh at me? How about that one? That's a good one. But then we take the chance or we, what about dance practice? What about trying out for dancing? What about being a ballerina? What about being a hip hop dancer? What if you're not good enough? Well, there's only one way to, to change that. And that's, go, that's, the, that's, that's going through the pain of remaining the same. It's a little bit of anguish. And then it leads to, it leads to becoming from being a rose to be, becoming a, from being a bud to becoming a rose. The fear of change. It says a bud becomes a rose when the, when the pain of remaining the same, not changing becomes greater, even more than the fear of change. It seems like as grownups, we just like as people, as human beings, we don't want to change so many times, but sometimes that fear of change is, is less than the pain of remaining the same. Like what if you stayed in second grade your entire life, you'd be so frustrated learning the same lessons over and over, you get to move to third grade, and you get to move to fourth grade, and you get to move to fifth grade, and it takes work to do that. And we don't wanna do that work. But the fear of change is less than the pain of remaining the same. Like who wants to stay in third grade for their whole life? Nobody. We want to grow and we want to become better. And so we, we put down our toys and we pick up a book. We start to think about math more. We start to really think about math. Like the same way we think about video games or the th same way that we think about Netflix or whatever. We think about math. It really just takes intention. Like remember what I said, if you don't know what to do, do something. If you don't know what to do, do nothing. But do it with intention. Don't just do nothing without intention. Like I'm just wasting time. It's okay to do that sometimes, but really, if you want to get something, you do it with intention every single time. If we want to change the world, if we're smart enough to change America, and you have this, you can, have you thought about how to make the world a better place? That would be intentional. You're intentionally thinking about how to make America better. And not just America, what about Pakistan? What about India? What about United Kingdom? What about Mexico? What about Jamaica? What about the Caribbean? What about Saudi Arabia? What about South Africa? What about Cameroon? What about Estonia? What about Russia? What about China? We are smart enough to change the world. We are smart enough to change our world. We're smart enough to change ourself. You are smart enough to change yourself. You are smart enough to change America. You are smart enough to change your country. You are smart enough to change the world. You are smart enough to do that. You may not know how to do it, but when think by thinking about it, by intentionally thinking about it, ideas come up and then you may not know how to implement those ideas. And then you have a conversation with people like me or people in your life, your parents, your family, your, your friends, your neighbors, your peers. That's the people who are the same grade as you or the same job as you. We can do this. We got this. Black lives do matter. All lives matter. So if one life it seems like it doesn't have as much matter as the other one, we get to change things. And even if the pain of remaining, the, even if the fear of change is there, the pain of remaining the same is greater than the fear of change. And we become a rose when we acknowledge that. When we face the fear of change. Because the pain of remaining the same is worse than the fear of change. This is a really important episode. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen with me today. Remember, if you want to change something, don't throw a tantrum. Sit. Be unmovable. Communicate. Sing songs. Cry. Fighting will only get fighting. It will only get fighting. You know this. Fighting only leads to fighting. But if I sit down and I take a seat, we'll change everything. And we can change the world together. That's a fact. Oh my gosh, look at the time. I th wait, wait, did my alarm go off this entire time? Oh my goodness gracious. I didn't know my alarm went off, my Q&A alarm. And I, I even had a question. Okay, so I'll have to answer the, the question next week, okay? That's our show for today, and I really appreciate your time. You've been amazing. You've been amazing. You are smart enough to change everything. I want you to remember a couple things. 
You are smart enough to change America. You are smart enough to change yourself. You are smart enough to change the world. And a bud becomes a rose when the pain of remaining the same becomes greater than the fear of change. That's how we grow. And that's how you're going to lead the way and show us how to do it. And if you don't know what to do and you're frustrated and no one's hearing you and, and you're not communicating, then just take a seat. You got it? If I haven't told you today, let me tell you right now. I love you. I love you like life itself. You're the reason I'm here. All right. Keep up the work. Keep up the good work. And the words of my people. Pa pa pow.